good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Miranda Hallett. I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work. I'd like to welcome you all this evening and thank you for coming to this panel in honor of blessed Oscar Romero, or Monsenor, as I first got to know him when I went to El Salvador in the 1990s uh, to do my research. Um, I heard nothing but stories of Oscar Romero for the first few weeks I was in the country, and I came to understand very quickly that what Salvadoran people were telling me, this person that Salvadoran people were telling me about was an immensely special person, a unique person who had played a, a prophetic and incredible role, not only in his country's uh, history, but also in, in the world and in, in be on behalf of human rights. He was a humble man, a very quiet man, in many ways a conservative man who nobody would have guessed uh, would have transformed into the prophetic voice for social justice that he became after he was appointed Archbishop of San Salvador. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you any more about Oscar Romero because I'm sure that all of our panelists have really wonderful stories to tell um, and I'm excited to hear from all of them. So I'm gonna give a very quick introduction of all of the panelists uh, that are here with us this evening and then we'll jump right into it. Um, so first, uh, on the right here, we have Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Ensilaco, uh, an associate professor of political science and the director of human rights research at the Human Rights Center here at the University of Dayton, also one of the co-founders of the Human Rights Center. And um, he actually worked in El Salvador at the time of the peace accords, so it's very excited to hear from him about his work and how it fits into Romero's legacy. Uh, next, we have uh, Mary Alice Ordonez from Catholic Hispanic Ministry in Dayton. Um, she is, I believe, the only person we're graced with this evening who's actually met Monsignor Romero. <laughs> so uh, I'm excited to hear her story of that and also of how um, Romero's legacy inspires the work that she does right here in our local community in Dayton. Uh, next, we have Sister Mary Wendell from the Cincinnati Sanctuary Coalition, and she's here to speak about the work of the sanctuary movement today and how it carries on Romero's legacy. Uh, next, we have Noel Rizzo, class of 2019, and a participant, two-time participant in the El Salvador Breakout through the Center for Social Concern. And she's gonna speak to us about um, her experience in El Salvador, the contemporary issues facing Salvadorans today, um, and the legacy of Romero in that. And finally, Sarah French, a graduate student from the UD School of Law, um, is going to speak to us about her uh, research uh, on a project on contemporary Central American migration. So please join me in welcoming all of our panelists. Good evening, I thought I'd speak up here. Um, so it's a marvelous coincidence that the um, canonization of Romero uh, coincides with the 20th anniversary of the creation of the Human Rights Studies Program uh, in December 1998. Um, Romero was my inspiration for proposing back then to President Brother Ray that we create a Human Rights Studies Program. Uh, Romero's influence is why we have the Archbishop uh, Romero Human Rights Award and Romero's influence is reflected in the Human Rights Center's mission insofar as the mission in, includes dialogue with the Catholic social justice tradition. So I wanna just make clear that uh, Romero's present here, in, he's incarnate here, if you will, in these institutions, and, and so it's remarkable that we have this anniversary. I wanna talk about who Mer Romero was. You know, we, you know the, the title of this discussion is Romero, pastor, prophet, martyr, saint, He's gonna be a saint because he was martyred, and he was martyred because he was a prophet, and he was a prophet because he was a pastor. I want to explain why they killed him as a political scientist. Right. In other words, I want to answer this fundamental question. How is it that this bishop, Romero, who was the oligarchy's choice right, to be archbishop, came within a few short years to be uh, an enemy of the oligarchy, such that they would decide to murder him. Right? That's the fundamental, fundamental question. So to understand Romero's ministry and martyrdom, you have to understand what Romero in his fourth pastoral letter called El Salvador's National Crisis. And the crisis was this. Um, the security forces were severely and brutally repressing 
popular organizations that had mobilized to bring profound change to a profoundly unjust Salvadoran society. This was seen as subversion by the military and, um, and the security forces attacked them brutally and ultimately killed Romero. That was the national crisis. You know, so to understand Romero, you have to understand the national crisis. Now I want to take you back to February 1977 for a minute because uh, you remember it well. Uh, it was an incredible time. El Salvador, this tiny poor country already in crisis, was going to have a presidential election, sure to be fraudulent, and the appointment of a new archbishop. Ironically, both were named Romero. The presidential candidate, the choice of the oligarchy, was General Carlos Humberto Romero, who was the oligarchy's choice because he was Minister of Defense and he was good on repression. Oscar Romero was the oligarchy's choice for archbishop because he was known to be a conservative priest. Right? When he was Bishop of Santiago de Maria outside of San Salvador, he wasn't known to be one of these bishops who supported those subversive pastoral activities in the countryside, you know, agitating with the campesinos to fight for justice. In fact, when he was editor of the Archdiocese newspaper, Orientacion, he publicly criticized priests for their political theology. In fact, I wasn't sure I was going to say this. He publicly named three people, and two of them ended up dead, Ignacio E. Acuria and Amando Lopez. So Romero, Archbishop Romero, was the perfect choice. He was going to maintain the cordial, some would say cozy relationship between the church, the government, and the military and the oligarchy. And this was key uh, to the beginning of the national crisis. So what went wrong? You know, General Romero is going to be removed in a coup in October 79. And five months later, Archbishop Romero is, is martyred. So what went wrong? The repression and Romero's response to the suppression. These are the reasons they killed him. His episcopate was baptized in blood. The fraudulent election was the 20th of February. Romero had been archbishop for three weeks. Thousands of people turned out in San Salvador to protest the fraudulent election. The National Guard opened fire on him in front of the National Cathedral and killed 400 people. In March, assassins ambushed and assassinated Father Rutilio Grande, close personal friend of Romero. In July, they assassinated another priest, Alfonso Navarro, and it went on and on. If you studied the history of El Salvador at the time, not a month went by without some new atrocity for Campesinos. Read Romero's homilies. They read like reports of Amnesty International. Right? His weekly summaries, he would summarize how many people were killed and disappeared the previous week. So his first sin against the oligarchy was he denounced the repression publicly, publicly. When he was Archbishop of Santiago Maria, there was a massacre of peasants in his diocese. He went privately, he wrote privately to the president and went privately to the commander of the National Guard and he said, stop this. But as Archbishop, he publicly and repeatedly denounced the repression. And in doing so, and he documented it, he created a human rights office, Socorro Juridico, which documented repression. And so coming from the Archbishop, these denunciations of the violence validated external reports of the repression that the regime was denying. Sin number one. Sin number two, he broke with the regime. He boycotted the inauguration of President Romero and he refused during his entire episcopate to go to any official act. He was welcome to dialogue with the government, but only if the government clarified, conducted investigations and brought to justice those responsible for the atrocities, which of course they never did. So he boycotted them through his entire episcopate. So but think about this now. You have one of the most powerful institutions of Salvadoran society, the church, breaking with the state. Essentially, under Romero, the church had delegitimized the regime. That's a sin. Right? He won the affection of the poor. Right? He met with them. He interacted with them. The poor loved him and came to see in Romero the symbol of their own cause for justice. He encouraged them. Romero encouraged them to defend their own rights. Romero is encouraging the very people the security forces are killing. At this point, Romero becomes one of those agitator priests. Right? He supported the clergy and the religious and the ladies' efforts to do pastoral work in the countryside, something that he seemed not to want to do when he was Bishop of Santiago de Maria. Suddenly, he was behind the cause. Right? And he defended the priests, the religious, and the clergy who were persecuted themselves. Many of these people were killed. He defended against charges of communism. Right? 
In other words, he became their public spokesman. This made him dangerous. He supported the popular organizations. Remember, the national crisis is the repression of these popular organizations that began to emerge in the 1970s after a fraudulent election in 1972. Organization is the most dangerous thing to a dictatorship. Organization of the popular masses is especially dangerous, particularly in the countryside. In his third pastoral letter, Romero, as archbishop, formally endorsed the popular organizations. The enemy of the regime, right? He laid out the argument in theological terms, citing Catholic social teaching, all, going all the way back to Rerum Novarum of 1893, right? citing the natural right of people to organize in their own interest. And he cited the Salvadoran Constitution. And he decried the fact that the rich had their own organizations, the Cattlemen's Association, the Coffee Girls Association, the Bankers Association, but the poor couldn't have their own organizations. They couldn't have trade unions. They couldn't have farm uh, cooperatives. So, because this was a pastoral letter, this is an official pr pronouncement of the church endorsing organizations the regime thinks are subversive and publicly criticizing the regime for illegally preventing the poor from organizing. Do you see the danger this guy is getting himself in? Uh, violence. Romero was accused of being a communist. Well, one of the great slogans at the time was, be a patriot, kill a priest. You know, say a patriota, mata un sacerdote, great slogan, right? He was accused of being a communist. He denounced communism. He denounced any false ideology of liberation, right, that didn't bring the true liberation of the gospel. But in his pastoral letter on the popular organizations, he did not foreclose the possibility of armed violence against the state. He cited Catholic social teaching, just war doctrine. He spoke of a situation of an explosive revolution of despair among the people. And this was at a time when he refused to categorically denounce uh, armed struggle that the Salvadoran military knew that armed groups were forming in El Salvador. There were already three by 1980 when he was killed, there were five. At the end of 1980, they formed the Farabunda Martin National Liberation Front and the war was on. This was dangerous to them. And Romero became an international figure he received awards from Georgetown and Louvain. We've got an award for him. He was called to go everywhere. He couldn't leave the country during the crisis. They came to him. He became internationally recognized. And as El Salvador descended deeper and deeper in a crisis, the international community became involved. In July 1979, in Nicaragua, there was a, a revolution, the Sandinista Revolution. And if it could happen in Nicaragua, it could happen in El Salvador. So the United States and the international community and the UN were all looking to El Salvador, and they looked at Romero. They looked at Romero. The international community knew if there was going to be any peaceful resolution to this. If there was going to be any peaceful project, Romero would have to endorse it. Romero became the most important politician in, in the country because of his moral voice and his office. Right? He became dangerous. When Romero spoke, when he denounced the regime, when he defended the popular organizations, with that international stature, he became deadly. Romero always claimed he didn't meddle in politics. Romero meddled in politics. In the last five months of his life, October, it's going to be really ironic that he's going to be canonized on October 14th. On October 15th, 1979, there was a coup. All right? Overthrow General Romero instituted a revolutionary government of civilians and soldiers. The soldiers came to Romero and said, we're going to stage a coup, and they wanted endorsement. Romero said, we'll take a wait-and-see attitude. But when the revolutionary government was formed, he endorsed it. He endorsed their proposals until it became clear that this new revolutionary junta was as violent as, as the previous ones, and then he turned its back on them. And when the popular organizations formed something called the Revolutionary Coordinator of the Masses and issued public programs that conflicted with the government's official policies, Romero supported the popular organizations over the government. He took sides, and this made him dangerous. Okay. And finally, because I know I'm out of time, his letter to Jimmy Carter, and his penultimate sermon. 17th of February, 34 days before his assassination, his martyrdom, Archbishop Romero writes to Jimmy Carter as a Christian, right, and he appeals to the President of the United States to suspend military aid to El Salvador. There wasn't much. There wasn't much. They were sending non-lethal 
right, aid to the National Guard who was killing people. And he appealed to Carter not to send aid. And he denounced the government as a military dictatorship, worse than a previous military dictatorship, that was killing so many people. And he gave death tolls. So here you have, I mean, this is a, this is a direct threat to the military. The military in El Salvador knows the guerrillas are forming and is facing the prospect of a civil war where it's not prepared to fight. And it needs military assistance from the United States, which is concerned with preventing another Marxist revolution like the one in Nicaragua happening in El Salvador. And the Archbishop appeals to the President of the United States not to send military aid. This was incredible. 34 days. I mean, I, I'm convinced that his death warrant was signed then. And finally, his final not his final sermon because he, he died giving his final sermon on the 24th of March at a funeral. But on the 23rd in the cathedral, broadcast over the radio, he gave, you should read it, you should listen to it, gave an incredible speech. It sounds like Amnesty International report talking about the massacres. But at the end, he makes a special appeal. He says, I wanna make a special appeal to the men in the National Guard. You are our brothers and you're killing your campesino brothers. No one is obligated to obey an illegal order that conflicts with the, the law of God, thou shall not kill, right? And then of course, his famous lines where he said, in the name of God, in the name of these suffering people whose laments rise to heaven each day more tumultuously, I ask you, I beseech you, I beg you, I order you, in the name of God, stop the repression. I can tell you from personal experience, I didn't meet him, but I met the director of his legal, he knew that would get him killed, and he knew that would get him killed in 24 hours, and he said it anyway. He was appealing to the President of the United States to spend military aid, and he was appealing to the men to mutiny. That's a death sentence, and they killed him for it. At another time, maybe in questions, I'll give a little theory, but I'll just simply say this. From a strategic point of view for the right wing, murdering him was a brilliant move. They had to remove a moderate centric voice to present Ronald Reagan, who would be elected in November, a stark choice, side with us the extreme right, despite the human rights abuses, or side with the extreme radical left and risk another Marxist revolution in Central America. That was the choice that the oligarchy wanted to present Reagan because they were eliminating the moderate middle, most importantly to Romero. They wanted a war, and the way to get that war was to kill Romero. Romero died in March. The FMLN formed in October, the war started January 10th, 1981. So I'll conclude with this. So, um, Romero's gonna be a saint because he was a martyr. And he was a martyr because he was a prophet. And he was a prophet because he was a pastor. And in the national crisis in El Salvador, to be a pastor meant you had to be a prophet. And to be a prophet meant you would be killed. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Professor Miranda Hallett, for your kind invitation to be a part of this important panel. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share with you what we do in our ministry and how I think we identified with the legacy of our Bishop Oscar Arnulfo Romero. The beginning of the Hispanic Catholic ministry of Dayton can be traced to a meeting which a delegation from Dayton requested with Bishop Pilar Sik in 1980. At that time, he was auxiliary bishop of Cincinnati. The delegation was composed of members from Cuba and Mexico. Nowadays, we had families from all countries of Central America, as Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and South America as Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, Peru, and others. What we do in our ministry, we support the necessities of the community covering the critical areas of immigration, 
community, cultural traditions, and youth development, among others. In terms of immigration, we regularly host clinics in collaboration with immigration lawyers so we can keep our communities informed of all immigration policies and the latest changes. Hosting and supporting citizenship clinics in collaboration with immigration lawyers and other organizations, we stress to our parishioners the importance in applying for U.S. citizenship. In some cases, when needed, we accompany our parishioners to their appointment with immigration and other court cases. We support our youth who are protected under the DACA program that stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Last year, when the program was sadly terminated by the president, we protested and participated in marches and rallies. We also went to the offices of Ohio senators and representatives at the Congress in Washington, and we also collected and sent to them more than 15,000 letters to advocate for the continuation of the program, which permits our youth like you to have temporary legal status. This allows them to work, to apply for a driver's license, and help them to continue their education at the universities or colleges. Every six months, we meet with the Montgomery County Immigration Councils. These meetings include the Dayton Chief Police, Sheriff of Montgomery and Clark Counties, U.S. Court Southern District of Ohio, and other members of other important organizations. In order to keep them and ask them to help us in all of our happenings in our Hispanic community. In other words, we do our best to welcome our new immigrants and refugees. We let them know that they're not alone, that someone here cares for them. We know that in the majority of cases, they do not come to the United States because they want to, but more often because they want to put food on the table for their families. There are simply no opportunities in their home countries. In terms of community, we host and support health fairs in collaboration with Ohio State University, the University of Dayton, and Ohio Health Department. We host and support housing events in order to educate our community about the requirements to become homeowners. In terms of cultural traditions, we host two Latino festivals every year, one in Dayton and one in Springfield. This gives us the opportunity to share with the non-Latino community the traditions of the Hispanic culture. We also have our festive celebration, and I'm pretty sure that some of you are familiar with one of them, like um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Las Posadas, Las Pastorelas, Dia de Reyes, which means Three Kings Day, and others are being performed in all communities. And we do this to celebrate and contribute the various traditions of our Hispanic communities. Youth de Development. Yearly Youth Leadership Forum in Retreats, sponsored by the Institute of Pastoral Initiatives of the University of Dayton. These forums contribute enormously to the faith formation of our Hispanic youth. And for this, we would like to express our deepest gratitude to Sister Angela Sukowski and Liliana Montoya for all the support and dedication to our Hispanic youth over the years. And the list is long. Our mission is to get our Hispanic community know that the Archdiocese of Cincinnati through the Hispanic ministry is here for them, that they are not alone. And this is what I think we are identifying with the legacy of our Bishop Oscar Arnulfo Romero. We advocate for the immigrants. They are poor. We understand the reality of their pain suffering, discrimination, and separation of families that our Hispanic community is experiencing today. 
1979, I had the privilege and blessing to personally meet Archbishop Romero, once in my home country, Honduras, and a second time in El Salvador. I was young, like you. I didn't realize that, what, that was me, I was meeting a man of God. He was humble, always fighting and advocating for the poor, for the ones in need, and especially for justice. He always fought for no violence. He was a true prophet, a martyr, and he was assassinated because he stood up of the oppressed forces in his own country on behalf of the poor, as Mark said. <laughs> he certainly is our inspiration. Thank you for your kind attention, and God bless you. Hello? Oh, there it is. <laughs> hey guys, I am a senior here, um, studying international studies, math, and a minor in anthropology, which has put me in the good fortune of taking classes with Dr. Hallett, who introduced all of us earlier, and the ability to um, study a good amount of uh, history and culture of El Salvador um, with her, get to travel to El Salvador twice um, for two of the international breakouts, or the same international breakout once as a leader, over the winter to El Salvador. And I also got to work this past summer in a development uh, nonprofit with projects going on currently in El Salvador. So I've had the privilege of getting to know about the history and the culture and the people a lot. And um, in an effort to squeeze two life-changing semesters and two life-changing trips into 10 minutes, I'm going to share <laughs> um, a little bit about the uh, experiences that I had while in El Salvador as a group that we had and personally, and um, how those, the emotions that I share are things that Romero showed throughout his ministry, throughout his homilies and his broadcasts, and how those tie to his um, advocacy for human rights. So to start, just like Dr. Hallett said, when you get to El Salvador, it Oscar Romero was murdered in 1980. He's still the most talked about person there. His picture is everywhere. His name is on the airport and on everything. And um, the first part, thing we were told is he's one of the most loved and one of the most hated people in El Salvador. Um, people who are Catholic love hate or hate him. People who are on the left side, on the right side, poor, rich, it, it doesn't matter. People either really love him or really hate him. So you, we heard a lot about him a lot and saw his face everywhere that we went. Um, so when you go to a new place, and this was one of my first times out of the country, um, it's natural to feel displacement, and that's something that I think that anybody can uh, resonate with when going to a new place, and that's something that Romero showed that he resonated with um, when he originally started to encounter the poor in El Salvador. He was a conservative, as Dr. Ancelaco said. He started off as the perfect fit for the oligarchy to support them and not to advocate for the poor and not to stop the repression, but he began to encounter them. Um, it was said that at one point he uh, visited a poor community and somebody handed him a half-eaten tomato and he looked at it with disgust and was like, why the heck is someone giving me this you know, garbage or unwanted tomato? And um, the priest that was there responded saying, this is all they have to offer. It's their last possession, their sign of love, their gift to you. And it was something that, that was around the same time in uh, 76 and 77, mostly, when he started to um, convert and start to understand the lives and the reality that the repressed people were facing. Something that I learned from that, uh, from the displacement and how displacement can transform you, and it transformed, I think, everyone who was on our trip, um, is how it can show you different ways to receive love and to receive gift, and that's something that Romero learned and how to be one with others through that uh, exchange of love and of gift. The next thing that we experienced a lot of through both the study and being there was pain and sorrow and discouragement and hurt because we heard stories 
uh, firsthand accounts of massacres, and we heard firsthand accounts of people who currently are facing gang violence and forced migration, and they've lost family members, and they've um, been brutally tortured, and uh, it's it's amazing the amount, uh, the sheer amount of pain that it's so publicly public there. Like we have a lot of private violence here, and our security is very private there. There's public people with rifles outside of every Burger King and outside of every ice cream store. Like, you wouldn't imagine it until you're there, and you're like, why do they have a gun? And it's like, well, they have to protect themselves from the gangs. And it's very confusing, but it's something that we came to understand. People really opened up and shared with us. And one of the most touching things that I think I heard was when we met with someone who works with incarcerated youth and she works with a, um, a creative writing process with them, and they've written a ton of poetry, and I'm gonna read one of the poems that helps show how we humanize the people who are both the perpetrators and the victims of the violence. So this is a poem by a young man under the age of 18, somewhere between 14 and 18. And so think of if you have a younger sibling who's between 14 and 18 incarcerated for possibly murdering somebody or something because they have become a part of a gang, probably not because of their own choice. It's named, Know Me Before You Judge Me. You who think that imprisonment was the best solution. You who think that taking away my liberty would change me. You who want them to lock me up for life or worse. You who decided to label me as one of the worst diseases on earth. You who want to humiliate me with your criticism and bad opinions. You who mark me for a mistake and judge me without compassion. You who see me as less just because I lost my freedom for a while. Let me tell you, a prison will never change a person, much less someone like you. Your discrimination gives me ammunition to continue committing crimes since nobody offers me their hand to go forward. Maybe you haven't realized that I'm also a human being, like anyone else with defects, but also virtues, with mistakes, but also skills, with resentment, but also good feelings, with a past, but also a future, who smiles, but also cries. Instead of judging me, try to understand me and teach me to overcome. So things like that, encountering things like that, um, it's pretty crazy uh, when you think about, like, I have a 16-year-old sister, a 15-year-old sister, um, and we heard stories of 15-year-olds who, like I said, have murdered people, but at the same time, I, thinking about my sister, like, she couldn't have chosen to do that out of her own accord. Like, that's, we have to start humanizing people, as Romero did. Um, that's something he constantly called for, whether people were on the right or the left, whether they were um, the Campesinos, the guerrillas, the uh, would-be guerrillas in the future, or the um, repressive police, like Dr. Ansalaco also quoted, uh, to individually choose to stop repressing people, to individually choose to treat others with humanity. Um, and that's something that I think El Salvadorans still struggle with, Americans still struggle with, and all of that. And so um, he's an amazing example for that and for human rights. So we got through uh, displacement, pain, and sorrow. Uh, <laughs> the next uh, feeling that we came to understand was unity and oneness and hum common humanity. Um, so kind of flipping to hope and goodness. Um, something that, um, we, like homestays with people, we got to watch the sunrise over mountains, we got to dance, uh, eat ice cream, play silly soccer games and things like that. And it's all, it just reminds you like we're all just 20 year olds just hanging out. Like there's, it, we all live on the same planet and we have so much in similar, in common. The world isn't split into a dichotomy of the first world and the third world. We're all in one world. Um, and that's something that Romero, again, he was one who walked the walk. He was with the poor in solidarity with them. He had fun with them. He also, uh, in some of his homilies around the same time, I believe that Jimmy, he wrote the letter to Jimmy Carty, Carter just about a month before his death. He said in a public broadcast, Christ invites us not to fear persecution. Believe me, brothers and sisters, anyone committed to the poor must risk the same fate as the poor. And in El Salvador, we know what the fate of the poor signifies, to disappear, to be tortured, to be captive, and to be found dead. So a month before his death, he predicted his own death. He was like, I know I'm with the poor. I know that means I'm going to die. I'm going to be murdered. And he still decided to do that. So 
it's pretty powerful to think about um, just even though he was scared, we heard stories about how he would hide when the avocado tree would drop on his tin roof that he was staying at this like sister's place. Um, he had a room and avocado seeds would drop and he would like hide under his bed because he thought like people were shooting. He wasn't free from human fear. Like he, he had courage, but he was also scared, but he continued because he knew he was called to stand with them. The last of the emotions is hope. That was the greatest thing I was left with when I left El Salvador. Um, which was good because after the class I was pretty depressed. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the hope that we felt was shown, like there were youth who organized around hobbies, around hip hop and dance, around soccer and things like that so that they could stay free from the gang violence as well as from the possible extrajudicial killings that the police um, are known for committing right now, the human rights violations by the security there. Uh, we also saw hope in the one of the most the most prominent massacres that happened in El Mazote. Um, we visited that community and we learned about, they have created books of historical memory where they have community members share their stories and they put them together and they um, share them with their whole community to keep the memory of the massacres and of the hurt um, alive, as well as to show that they have hope together. And it was a really strong sense of community um, in a very different way than I see it at Dayton. Um, but of showing dependency and how people work together. Uh, yeah, while, while visiting a rural village or a memorial to a massacre, some people call that depressing. The people there allow the place to give them energy and that was infectious. That was something I think everyone in our group took as uh, powerful and hopeful and it was incredible. And so that brought me hope and I think that Romero is known for his death and his martyr being a seed of hope for that entire country, as well as um, anyone facing state persecution or any persecution. He was just consistently filled with love and compassion for those, and willingness to put himself in the same spot as those who were facing violence. Um, he would often be offered by like the, the people in charge um, the, uh, like a private security detail and he was like no I don't want it if you're going to give security detail to someone give it to like these communities that are being completely repressed and so they just laughed and didn't talk to him anymore um, so <laughs> overall though I think that my experience there and learning about all of this um, like I said life changing um, take Dr. Hallett's class go to El Salvador if you can um, but if you can't that's okay as well let, let the let the, um, I'm lacking the word for Romero's legacy, thank you, if to my own brain, um, let Romero's legacy like affect you, especially as he becomes a saint and is canonized next Sunday, uh, celebrate that because that's awesome, and um, he really acts as an example for us to fully advocate for the most marginalized in our lives, uh, because human rights, because they have human dignity, he, and part of human rights is being able to give and receive with people, to share with people, to be in solidarity with people. So let yourself be in solidarity with poor people, people who are different than you, people who don't look the same or who offer you half a tomato or I don't know. But um, so just like let Romero and El Salvador and anything you can get your hands on that teach you to love better and more courageously and diversely um, let that affect you. And that's something that, like, the most important thing I learned and the most important thing I think Romero's legacy can leave for us. Thank you. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so my name is Sarah French, and I'm a second year in the, in the law school. Um, I wanted to apologize, I had this PowerPoint that has some nice photos on it, um, but I guess instead you'll just have to look at me. <laughs> um, so I'm here to present on um, my summer research um, that I was able to perform in tandem with also Dr. Hallett and an undergraduate student named Chloe Massey Costales, some of you may know. Um, and this collaborative research project um, is on contemporary Central American migration. Um, and basically, I'm here today um, to discuss how the immigration system, particularly enforcement and policy, um, has led to immense human suffering, um, but how it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like this. Um, these are choices that 
the government has made, not just our government, but governments around the world, um, in this sort of weaponization of immigration um, from many levels fosters human rights abuses, and this is something that um, Oscar Romero would definitely have something to comment on if he were here today. Um, just in general, um, and I want to keep this section brief, but this summer I think uh, it's kind of impossible not to have heard about immigration in some realm after this summer. Um, from the implementation of the zero tolerance pro policy to family separation um, to huge changes in asylum. Um, the summer was an incredibly horrible time to be working in immigration. Um, but just to give you guys some context, I'd be happy to talk to anyone after about that. <laughs> um, Specifically, um, in the current statistics of El Salvador, um, currently of six million Salvadorian nationals, around 30 to 40 percent uh, live outside of the country. And currently around two to three million Salvadorian immigrants um, and their children live in the U.S. Um, this is more than any other Central American population in the U.S. right now. Um, and my fellow speakers have kind of already talked about kind of the historical context um, in the history of El Salvador a little bit, but um, just to reiterate, so from 1980 until 1982, um, El Salvador endured a civil war. Um, around 80 million, 92. sorry, what did I say? 82. 92. Um, around 80,000 died, um, around 1 million were displaced. Um, and this was also a U.S.-backed dictatorship. Um, the U.S. was sending funds, uh, training troops, and equipment uh, during the Civil War. Um, and after the war, um, we saw neoliberal free trade, um, which includes reduction of trade barriers, the privatization of public services, um, and also in tandem, uh, includes lower wages and less rights to the people. Um, so currently, El Salvador is uh, facing uh, increasing violence over the past two years. It actually has um, the highest murder rate um, of any country that's not currently in a declared war. Um, I feel like, and even myself, um, honestly, before working with Dr. Hallett this summer, when you hear El Salvador, you just think gangs, it's just written by gangs. And while there are gangs there, I think um, a lot of people don't understand the complexities of the situation that's going on in El Salvador. Um, it's a really complex situation, but it's a multi-dimensional armed conflict. So on one hand, you do have the gangs, the MS-13, 18th Street, um, as well as drug trafficking organizations. Um, but at the other hand, you do have state violence and these paramilitary death squads um, that are reciprocating the violence as well. Um, and this is due to the Mano Dura uh, campaign, which has been implemented by the El Salvadoran government, um, which basically targets civilians who are suspected of being gang members and who live in gang-dominated uh, communities. Um, and of course, this permeates a climate of impunity and fear um, throughout El Salvador. Um, and finally, de deportees from the U.S. Um, are at a high risk to be targeted. Um, not only, so when they come back to El Salvador, uh, the El Salvadorian government has issued Decree 717, which basically puts them in a system or in a list um, so they can keep track of them. And if they're suspected to uh, be, re be uh, related to a gang or have a gangster profile, um, the government has their information at hand. Um, and earlier last year, um, it was confirmed that the U.S. is also uh, helping fund uh, the government um, through funds, uh, military training, and equipment. Um, it was confirmed last year that 72.7 million um, dollars were funded um, to El Salvador. While there's a lot of secrecy concerning exactly where these funds are going, it is confirmed that some of this money is going to vetted groups, um, which include the paramilitary groups that um, are conducting this violence against gang members and anyone kind of caught in their way. Um, which basically, it's a horrible irony that with the stepped up uh, immigration policies of the U.S. We're not only deporting uh, people back to El Salvador, but we're also funding the violence um, that they're being subjected to at the same time. 
Um, I spent the majority of my summer in Mexico City working on a legal aid, and even there I was able to see um, a lot of the stigma and kind of stereotypes that people had about Central Americans in Mexico, as Mexico is a point of transit and a point of origin for um, quite a few Central American migrants. Um, and we've seen the militarization of these migration routes. Um, a few years ago, there was the murder of the 72 migrants in San Fernando, um, which is a horrible example of uh, just some of the, uh, the deaths that have occurred because of this. Um, so the journey across Mexico has become a site of violence and exploitation through smuggling, kidnapping, uh, stepped up extortion, um, Immigration has really kind of become an industry. Um, and like I said, when I was there, just being in the office or outside, just listening to comments and some of the conversations that I've had, um, there's definitely a segmentation of, of Central Americans. They're seen to be all be uh, gang members, delinquents, um, suspected of uh, the, um, the females are suspected to be bad mothers, leaving their children at home. Um, and this is definitely something that I noticed when I was there. Um, and also, the U.S. does fund um, this militar militarization in Mexico as well. Um, and finally, I was able to spend a few weeks on the border in El Paso, uh, where we also see the militarization of the border. Um, this is most commonly heard of through the wall. Um, and the wall actually consists of 640 miles of the wall, but the wall is primarily placed in, uh, in locations that are densely populated, so they have a lot of resources, um, and they're easy points to cross, um, which leaves the places that don't have the wall, which are the really treacherous and dangerous parts of the desert, which to get there, um, they're very dangerous um, and involves a lot of death. Um, and this quote from the U.S. Border Patrol in 1994 says, Traffic will be deterred or forced over more hostile terrain, less suited for crossing. Um, so there's strategic placement um, of where we're putting the wall, um, which is kind of, it is an ethical issue. Um, and then after that, there seems to be silence concerning these deaths. Um, and there are many, um, every year, um, migrants seem to be framed as criminals who were, who were asking for this. And even there's a call for build more, build the wall. Um, and finally, when I was in um, when I was in El Paso, I was able to observe immigration court hearings for about a week and a half, um, and just some general trends that uh, detainees are facing uh, from a legal standpoint through legal discrimination. Um, bonds are being set at fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand um, dollars. They're also being denied. <laughs> um, there's a huge issue um, with language barriers. Um, while I would say while I was there primarily, the language spoken was Spanish. There were quite a few um, detainees who spoke indigenous languages and I never saw an interpreter for them. Um, there's also, it's a very, very impersonal hearing. Um, I went to a few hearings that were actually televideo conferences. So the immigration judge was in the court with me and then um, the detainees, um, as well as the translator, were an hour or two or three hours away, um, and it was a Skype hearing. There were uh, what's it called? connection issues. At one point, we had to restart it multiple times. It is extremely impersonal, and I'm, it, it, I didn't even understand the hearing, um, so I can't imagine if, if this is your situation that you could fully understand it. Um, also, immigration judges are, there's a new immigration judge quota. Um, which mandates that immigration judges have to hear 700 cases a year, which is an insane amount, um, which of course leads to rush deportation hearings. Um, so those are just a few of the trends that I noticed. Um, and finally, to bring this all back, um, so the recent repression in El Salvador looks much like the same when compared to the 1980s during the Civil War when uh, Romero was speaking um, Central Americans are fleeing violence and being dehumanized and face legal discrimination, not only in El Salvador, but on the route to the United States at the border when they're crossing the border, but then even in the United States, um, I would argue they're still uh, treated as second-class citizens. Um, to end, I would like to read this quote um, 
who was sent to, it was sent to me um, from a friend on the border. Um, it says, the law is like a serpent. It only bites the feet of those who are barefoot. Oscar Romero, um, August 20th, 1978. Um, so not only was Oscar Romero a martyr and a saint, but he was also a promoter of human rights um, and a voice providing insight into key critical legal thinking and human rights theory. Um, basically, to end, we would hear Oscar Romero's voice today. So thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Mary Wenlin. I'm a sister of the Precious Blood. And um, I have been working with the Salvadorian community since 1980. Um, I'm here tonight because I represent the Sanctuary Coalition in Cincinnati, but I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of how I got involved in this work. In 1980, I lived on the border, and um, I lived in a, a little town called Summerton, Arizona, which is 15 miles south of Yuma, and Yuma is a town right next to the border of Arizona and California. And we lived 15 miles north of the Mexican border of San Luis Sonora. Um, we were not in any position to receive anyone that came up uh, through the border. They were not in any position to go past our town because if they did, they would have been picked up by what they call the migra or we called the green bean then because they ran around in green tanks. Um, so we really didn't get involved in it, but we heard a lot what was going on in Tucson. Now, Tucson is five hours east of Summerton, Arizona, and there was no social media, there was no email, there was no fax. We had a telephone and a newspaper in a small little town. But everybody knew what was going on in Tucson with the Salvadorians that were coming up across the border. The first Presbyterian church in Tucson, Arizona started the sanctuary movement. They realized that these Salvadorians, the, the Salvadorians were coming up with no place to go, with just a plastic bag in their hand, with a passport and usually their birth certificate in that bag. So they kind of like started the first underground railroad in the 80s. It was completely different because people were providing hospitality and safety to people who were fleeing from another country. I did have a very good friend of mine who ended up being the um, chauffeur from Tucson all the way up to Northern California for the immigrants that were fleeing because um, Pastor Fife and Sister Darling Nagorski, who were heading the movement, were not able to leave Tucson because they were under arrest for what they were doing. So that kind of opened my eyes, even though I wasn't in it directly. And I came back and I was in Washington, D.C. and worked with Salvadorians for many, many years. I also became aware that when one of the nuns, one of the four church women that was killed in El Salvador who were mur murdered in 1980, they were harboring people who were fleeing the violence on the fourth floor of a convent in Aguilares. So there's a history here of religious women and there's a history here of Christians harboring those who are fleeing violence. It begins back with the early church. In our present day moment, we see it in the Underground Railroad with our African American brothers and sisters. And in 2007, the sanctuary movement was revived. I just put a side note in 19, was it 1980? In California, one of the pastors, a Lutheran pastor, started the sanctuary movement up there because he had taken in uh, conscientious objectors 
who were fleeing the United States for Canada back during the time of the Vietnam War. And he began to think, if I did that then, I need to do that now. And that's how it started. So when sanctuary starts, people become all become aware of their Christian duty to their fellow person that's beside them. But sanctuary today is a little different. It's not to people who are fleeing from Central America or any other country. It's for our neighbors. It's for our people here who may have an immigration case and they had an order of deportation which they did not follow. So they can be picked up, detained, but they still could have a case that could be reopened somewhere. It takes so long in our immigration system to do anything that people have to have a safe place to live. And that's where sanctuary comes in, where people are provided hospitality, they're provided food, they're provided a place to live. But most of all, they're provided solidarity. It's not done for those seeking sanctuary. It's done with. The other important thing about sanctuary in our Cincinnati coalition is that it's public. Because harboring someone in private can be a federal offense. But giving hospitality to somebody in public, with the public know about it, according to the Sixth Circuit, is not a harbor, harboring an offense. So it's very important to a lot of our legal minds today in our parishes and congregations. It's the first thing that comes up, are we gonna get in trouble, you know? ICE, which does, some of, which does the enforcement on our immigrant community, has come out with a memorandum in 2014 that said, there are sensitive locations in which they will not go. They go to the very door but I've never seen them go in. One of them is our churches, mosques, synagogues. Another site is a hospital and a school. Other sites are supposed to be rallies, but we understand how dangerous it is for anyone who does not have papers to be in a public rally. But that's supposed to be a sensitive location. They're not supposed to interrupt funerals nor weddings. Those are the sensitive locations. So far, they have obeyed it. It's very, very important to educate your congregation. It's very important to get a buy-in before you ever do sanctuary. Because there are people who are scared. There are people who don't know what to do. And there are some people who just don't believe in it. So it's real important to have a dialogue about what it is, who's gonna participate, and get your congregation together and say, if you cannot follow this, then can you please step over to the side and let the rest of us carry it out? In Columbus, there is a woman called Edith Espiel. She's in sanctuary for a whole year now in Columbus in a small church in Clintonville. They did not have a plan, and we have a plan, a very detailed plan, but they did not have a plan, and so they had to start from scratch. And they got their community together, provided her a little room, and then decided they raised $5,000 to put a shower in. So there's all different ways to do sanctuary. You can have a plan, or you could take in somebody with your knowledge of your congregation, and then you just work from there. There's a lot of things for people to do in sanctuary provide food, hospitality, give people rides, take people places, go to school, go to parent conferences for the mother or father who may be in sanctuary. But I just wanted to, want to give all of you a challenge tonight. You know, at your age, it's probably we were all that age when we were involved in the Salvadorian movement. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you cannot go to any place that's dangerous where our brothers and sisters are suffering. Because as long as you have allies on the ground, the people that are there, they will lead you where to go. It's the only way we really see the suffering that's really going on in our brothers and sisters all over the world. Get involved. 
Get yourself involved in a movement. Look at it. See what you can do. It's one of the most wonderful things that can happen. It's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. I've been to El Salvador at least 13 times. I went down for the peace accords, and I will never forget it. And I never thought the day I said yes to join the movement that this would ever happen to me. So thank you for listening. Thank you for coming tonight. And get involved. Get involved with our immigrant brothers and sisters. Talk to our friend here how maybe you can help with ESA. ESL classes in the immigrant community over in St. Mary's Parish. There's a lot you can do. Even if you don't speak Spanish, it's okay. There's plenty of DACA kids out there your same age, and they need your camaraderie. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. That was amazing. Um, so we do have a little bit of time for some questions and answers. If you have uh, something to ask, Dr. Ensilaco, Mary Alice, Sister Mary, uh, Noel, or Sarah. Um, so please do ask your questions. Anybody? Comments? Yes. Um, I would say maybe 5,000, maybe, more or less. I'm, I'm not accurate on that, but uh, more or less, yeah. You're talking about refugees, right? Yeah. Or not immigrants, right? Cause yeah. Both? Including both? Mm -hmm. That will be more than 10,000. Mm. Yeah, about 15, I would say. See, right, now, right now in Cincinnati, I'm not so sure what's happening in Dayton, but we have folks coming to Cincinnati who crossed the border last month with their children. We had a woman come in the other day from Nicaragua. She was separated from her son from 40 days. So Ohio is becoming a magnet. Mm -hmm. um, because the Guatemalans have settled, the Mexican communities here, it's a magnet. So there's a lot of people out there that have just crossed the border that are coming up here. There's a, a, just one more note about um, migration to Ohio, particularly Central American migration. A few years ago, 2014, when there was a, um, a first surge in unaccompanied minors, children under 18 coming to the border from Central America. Some of them were resettled in Ohio or, or placed with sponsors in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so that's a population we have here. Our local office, ABLE LAWO office, advocates for basic legal equality. They provide legal aid to people who can't afford it. Um, they work with unaccompanied minors. Um, to, to help them through their legal cases. They also work with migrant farm workers, who is a which is a growing population in the state of Ohio. So there's a lot of stuff happening locally that people can be involved in, in many ways. Um, there's also currently um, in Columbus, there's a large population of Africans um, from Mauritania um, that are being uh, deported back to Mauritania. The issue being they are not rec recognized as citizens in their own country. Um, and once they go back to Mauritania, they are enslaved um, and not yet not recognized as citizens. They've been here for about 15 to 20 years. Um, and they've had an agreement with, with ICE that they attend these check-ins every so often. And now the, when they're in, attending their check-ins, they're being uh, detained and deported. So um, I've been working up in Columbus a few weekends. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning more about that, um, they can really use all the help they can get. So there, There's also, if any of you have some spare time and all you're studying, there's a great article in the Atlantic Monthly, How ICE Went Rogue and explains the history of ICE, which started after, you know, 9-11. But it has some great stories about what's happening to that community and how it started, like an underground, and how it surfaced. And these people are being deported. They got caught in a scam before, 
which happens to a lot of our brothers and sisters. So if you can get your hands on that article or online, it's an excellent article. Other questions and comments? Yes. Um, I mean, I don't know exactly a number, um, but 700 is a lot. Um, so they have to clear 700 cases a year. Um, they also get penalized if they defer cases to the, the Immigration Court of Appeals. Um, so cases are not being appealed either. Um, like I said, these are, I observed for about a week and a half to two weeks. I don't have a set number, but 700 is a, is a lot. Um, I mean, it's, it barely even felt like a hearing when I was there. I mean, uh, I was in the El Paso Processing Center. Um, they just, they walk in in groups of 10 to 15 and the hearings are like this. Um, a number that each human being can get an actual hearing is the number I would argue. So I'll add a little bit to that. Sometimes I serve as an expert witness in asylum cases in immigration court. And for an asylum case to get a really thorough hearing can easily take a day and a half. So, you know, 12 hours or so of different people appearing before the judge. There are often huge packets of like 400 pages that the judge is supposed to review for that case. Now, these are all cases that I'm working on that have legal representation. Uh, because immigrants in the United States do not have the right to representation in immigration court, the majority of them go through hearings more like what she's describing. So ideally, there would be, you know, the, the judge would have a couple of days to hear a case, but obviously 700 in a year is three or four a day, right? Yeah, I can, I can attest to that too. I've been an um, expert witness in a lot of cases, mostly from Columbia, women from Columbia um, fleeing sexual violence. and. Um, I mean, there's two things about the process. So you, you're a country expert and you talk about the, the background. It can take years. I mean, the, we had a judge die. And, you know, it's, and it gets, you know in one sense, the, the family gets another year, another, another year and a half. On the other hand, they're in limbo. But the thing that struck me most about it is um, it all depends on the judge. You, you know, if you get in front of a judge who's just sympathetic, and, but you can tell immediately, I mean, they're administrative judges. Their job is to deport people. Their job is to not to give due process. And you can tell immediately when you talk to a judge if um, he's listening to um, or not. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really, and then if you haven't been there or interacted with me people, uh, it's very difficult to explain to an immigration judge uh, why a woman's fleeing her husband or the, the, well, you know, you didn't report sexual violence. Well. To who? I mean, the police? Who, who? I'm more likely to get raped by the police than. So it's very difficult for Americans to understand just the level of uh, trauma, and just really the gravity of the, just exactly what they're fleeing. We have time for one or two more questions. Yeah. I think I, I've you know, been reading his homilies and the pastoral letters over and over, and you're, and you're right about that. What he did talk about was internal displacement. People would come, and you talk about Aguilares. I, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult uh, to imagine the terror people lived in, in in some of these rural hamlets, 
like El Mazote, where they come in and you don't know if they're going to kill. Uh, but if you suspect you're on a list because, you know, you went to the <laughs> one of your seminars, you know, you're one of these leftist, you know, Center for Social Concern, that will get you killed. <laughs> Center for Social Concern is Parti mm -hmm. Communist Party of El Salvador, right? I mean, um, and so they would go and there was a lot of that. I'm thinking, and you were there in 80, I'm thinking the, the mass displacement began with the war. And, and, you know, Chalatenango and Usulutan mm -hmm. and some of these provinces were the guerrillas. And, you know, one of the interesting was um, one of the atrocities really early on, uh, October 80, thousands, hundreds of Salvadorans are fleeing Salvador into Honduras mm -hmm. to get away from a military operation. Mm -hmm. And the Honduran military blocked the river and the helicopter guns, U.S. helicopter, by the way, the number was $1.5 million a day oh, right. we gave the Salvadorans. Um, just gunned them down in Rio St. Paul and then Rio Lempo, um, Rio Lempa. So people were trying to flee. Now, the sanctuary movement we were involved in, they were coming here. And they were showing up at churches. Like in, uh, in my hometown, Buffalo, they showed up. We eventually got them into Canada. It was, a, it was a horrible irony because you can't have the Reagan administration acknowledge refugees from a country that we're saying is democratic. You know, refugees flee Cuba. They don't flee a country you're giving $1.5 million a day to. But they came. And you could go to Los Angeles and meet guerrillas, right? I mean, people who fled. One of the amazing experiences I had, I met a man who cried in my living room because he tried to join the guerrillas and when it came the first time shooting at a target, which is not a bullseye, it's a human, right? It's a human shape. He said he couldn't do it. And he cried in my living room and said, God forgive me that I can't kill another human being. And I asked him, like, why would you need God's forgiveness for not killing? He said, because in my country, that's the only alternative for this repression. So what I'm thinking is they fled the war. And, and the other thing is, is we talk about MS-13. MS-13 are Salvadorans that learned from the Bloods and the Crips in Los Angeles and then got deported back. So we brought them here, they fled here. Sometimes we brought them. Families of um, wealthy business owners, we brought, the government, the United States government brought. And they ended, up in, they ended up in gangs in Los Angeles and we deported them and now they're coming back. I mean, it's just, you know, I hadn't thought about in this preparing this presentation at this panel, it's like, you know, hearing all of you been there recently, mm -hmm. it's the same situation, just with different acronyms, right? Mm -hmm. It's MS-13, not, you know, MR-13. The, the other thing is some of the first people that, that were fleeing El Salvador were labor leaders oh, yeah. and educators. And I worked with a woman who was in medical school. And as um, soon as the medical school got bombed out, you know, and the whole university was destroyed, um, she left and came to the States. So there were a lot of people fleeing first. It wasn't your poor campesinos that were coming at first. It was people who were more educated who had a connection to somebody in the States. And, and then the pipeline started. The other reason why people are sending remittance home is because there was a, the American Baptist case in 1992 because only 1.8 or 9% of folks won asylum in the 80s from Guatemala and El Salvador. So there was an American Baptist church case that was settled with the old INS that gave Salvadorans and Guatemalans temporary protective status and gave Salvadorans the right to apply for asylum as a group. And now the Trump administration wants to take it away. The TPS they've had for 20 years, Hondurans, Haitians, and them. But then there's a judge that's ruled. They're thinking about they're not going to be able to take it away. So if you can keep up on those things, you know, and advocate for those things. They shouldn't be stopped, you know. The judge that ruled that he does not want to stop the program of TPS ruled, maybe they shouldn't have kept it that long, but you cannot displace people and ruin their lives who for 20 years have worked in our country, paid their taxes, raised their kids. We cannot do that as Americans. So I think if you can really get involved in that, 
you know, there's lots of Salvadorians around here, Hondurans and other people, are not as many as on the coast, but they're people who have TPS and they're scared to death, you know, that they might have to go back to their country, you know, if their TPS runs out. Mm -hmm. Another um, contemporary issue that I'm sure all of you have heard about is the separation of uh, children from families and also the presence of um, of minors who are incarcerated in immigration detention. So at this point, there are 13,000 children under the age of 18 that are held incarcerated in either immigration prisons in the United States or in a tent city that's in Western Texas. Um, and that there is a actually a proposed rule right now that's on the federal register. There's the comment period is open now. You can comment until November 7th. The proposed rule would allow for these children to be held in detention indefinitely rather than having to be released as soon as possible or within 20 days of their apprehension. So that's something that any citizen, any resident of the country actually can make a comment on on the federal register. So if you look for uh, family separation in the fe federal register, you'll find that. Um, and that's actually this, this moment where so many Central Americans, that, by the way, most of the children who are in immigrant detention are Central Americans, either from Honduras, El Salvador, or Nicaragua. Um, or Guatemala too. Um, and it's only really the most recent manifestation of a long history of the separation of families through this process of displacement and migration that Central Americans have experienced. Um, and unfortunately, it's amping up. So one of the things that I often um, encounter is people think that, oh, well, yes, El Salvador, it's messy, it's violent, it's always been that way and kind of always will be. That's the thought, right? But myself, as a person who's been working in El Salvador for 20 years, I can tell you the last two or three years have been radically different than anything I've seen before. And it's reflected in the, in the mass number of people who are fleeing the country. It's finally been recognized by the United Nations, Special Rapporteur, who went to visit earlier this, this year. It's finally being acknowledged and recognized by the government of El Salvador them, itself that they have a problem with internal di displacement due to violence and threats of violence. Um, it's an acute crisis, and it's resulting in a total shift in who arrives at the, at the U.S.-Mexico border. This summer, I was, part of, I was interviewed in a sort of disastrous interview on in NPR, and one of the things that the interviewer asked me was, how many MS-13s are trying to get into our country? Now, of course, I should have said, MS-13 started in the United States and has no reason to try to infiltrate the U.S. because it's had a continuous presence here as a gang organization since then. But I wasn't that quick on my feet, but that, that question sponsored me, spurred me afterwards to look up the numbers, and I found out that 0.1% of Border Patrol apprehensions are designated as MS-13 members, 0.1%, one-tenth of 1%, where while 40% of people apprehended by the Border Patrol are either children or families traveling with small children, 40%. So when you think about those numbers, it's very clear what this population of migrants is that's arriving at the southern border right now, right? Any, maybe one last question or comment from the audience, or, and then I'll give our panelists one last chance to speak as well. Yes, please. Anything in particular? <laughs> we have an election year right now. And so, um, so they have two parties. One came out of the guerrilla team, um, which is the FMLN, and then the other was, is ARENA, which started with the main people who um, ran the uh, death, squad. death squads. <laughs> it literally started with the, the like, It the was founded by the... Founded by the man who ordered Romero murdered. Yes. So, um, but that's their right wing party and their left wing party is the FMLN and we got to meet with them um, my first year in El Salvador in 2017. And so primarily both are for Mano Dura, what she spoke about, the, um, and now it's Super Mano Dura, uh, which is Super Iron Fist is what it means. And they refer to gang members as rats and as these different terrible names, and they dehumanize them constantly, and they've um, justified death squats and ex extrajudicial killings. That's from the left and the right. That's from citizens all across El Salvador because they're so sick of the gang violence, they see the only way to get rid of it, more violence. Um, the other issues that we spoke to them about went everything from like 
how like the person we spoke to from Morena um, spoke about how Romero was a communist who stole things from Castro and all this other stuff, which was very interesting. Um, the guy from the, the FMLN spoke about his days in the guerrilla war. So a lot of them are very politicized um, in the way that they like speak about things to Americans. So they like are very, he told a very much like guerrilla, I was in the war story. And the Arena guy was not very aware of his audience at the beginning, but um, <laughs> he eventually, um, eventually started to be very careful about what he said. And uh, I think the biggest news is that the uh, mayor of San Salvador, who has proven to do some really cool changes, like between the two years we were there, the city had some amazing um, changes that like up to the, the public spaces were just totally redone and improved. And they said that was due to the like lack of laundering of money for the first time in mm -hmm. a long time. And so he was a really great guy. He's not running with either Arena or FMLN and he's running independent or some other party for this coming election, which is happening soon. I, don't, mm -hmm. I haven't kept up with it, but um, yes. I don't know if that answered, but that's the current, they have a similar democratic uh, type set up as the US, mm -hmm. though, with a left party and a right party that are strong. And they do have other parties that are stronger than our independent parties, but or libertarian party, but yeah. And uh, is the, one of the things that, the areas that I've specialized in is actually government systems and institutions in El Salvador. So I've done a lot of interviews with current and former members of the Salvadoran government. Definitely don't want to give the impression that it's this, you know, monstrous, beast that is killing people, while it's true that extrajudicial killings by state security forces, by police and military, uh, have become a real problem in El Salvador, it's just like governments anywhere, right, or the state anywhere. There are lots of people that are part of it and who have different ideas and different missions and different roles to play. There's many amazing people working in the Salvadoran government, but there are also huge problems with corruption, um, huge problems with the infiltration of, of mainstream institutions by um, international drug trafficking organizations, which are not the MS-13 or the 18th Street, by the way. Um, and those problems really uh, have created a crisis in the rule of law, right? And so a lot of people, even like the frontline police officers, I have a lot of sympathy with them, even in cases where I could condemn their actions as violating human rights, right? Because they're really caught between a rock and a hard place, and they're desperate to protect themselves and to carry out what they see as their mission of, you know, controlling the gang uh, violence problem. Uh, but they have not enough resources and not enough institutional support, and frankly, a policy approach that has failed for a long time, right, that they keep trying again and again. So I don't know if that addressed more or less your questions. If you just contrast the situation that led to the war to the situation now, and I haven't been to Salvador in a while, but I'll just tell you, I was in Los Angeles right after the Rodney King riots. You don't remember that, but there was a black um, motorist who was stopped and he was beaten by police, and the police were acquitted and there was riots and they were incredible. Uh, burnt down part of what, you know, East LA. And uh, I, I was there and I was talking to um, former guerrillas, FMLN guerrillas who were living there. Um, and they found it incomprehensible. There was a, there's so much anger um, and about 50% of the people arrested by the police were, were Hispanic. I mean, it was just anger towards Korean grocers who sold them rotten eggs, I mean, rotten tomatoes. But this gorilla who had fought tw all 12 years and just couldn't understand why people could be so explosively angry and burn down their own neighborhood. Because in El Salvador, what they did with the repression was be able to just recruit campesinos to join the guerrilla forces. And they became 12, 14,000 strong by the end of the war. Now I listen to your stories about contemporary in El Salvador, and it sounds like the Rodney King riots. I mean. You know, those, those people in MS-13 would have joined the guerrilla ranks, but they fought for a purpose. This just seems to be uh, fratricide. Uh, and it's just amazing that the, the presidents who condoned some of the right-wing killings were former guerrilla commanders. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's just amazing. So it's, it's incomprehensible to look back at El Salvador where the level of violence seems to be mm -hmm. as, as high as it was, and you don't have a civil war. Mm -hmm. Some of my interviewees this summer, I did the San Salvador component of the research that Sarah was telling you about. She was working in Mexico City and El Paso. Um, but some of my interviewees were saying precisely that they can't believe 
that the same people who were victims of state violence in the 1980s are now the perpetrators of it, are now ordering the police and the death squads to go out and, and kill. Um, that power has corrupted them. <laughs> or maybe, anyway. <laughs> um, I just wanna say uh, uh, one last word myself, then I'll pass the word uh, down the panel. Um, when I was in El Salvador this summer as well, I went to visit uh, the very first family that I lived with in El Salvador in this rural community and um, went out to have lunch with them, spent the morning walking around the fields. They live in a beautiful, beautiful community that's also a coffee and sugar cane cooperative. Um, and we came back, we had lunch, and then they said, do you wanna listen to Monsignor? And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, every Friday the radio here plays you know, one of his homilies and we like to listen to it. And I said, okay, great. And we sat there together and quietly listened you know, to, to Monsignor's homily. And when it finished, you know, it was about, I don't remember all the details, but it's, it was, you know, now 40 years old almost, but it spoke to the present moment so perfectly. It spoke to uh, the needs of the poor and the need of, of all people everywhere for their, to save their own morality, to heed that cry, right, and to respond to it uh, with justice. Um, so, Monsignor Romero, que vive. <laughs> Um, so now I'd like to invite the panelists to say one last word, if you would like to, um, beginning with Dr. Ensalak. I just want to reiterate that we're at the 20th anniversary of the Creation of the Human Rights Program, um, and it was inspired by Romero. I mean, in my own personal case, I'd never heard of Romero. I was studying to be a biblical scholar at Harvard when word came of Romero, and I remember I was reading the prophet Amos, and then I started to hear about Romero and El Salvador, and a war broke out, and, and I had this realization as a student that I didn't want to study that anymore, that, that, that I wasn't reading the prophet Amos, I was parsing Hebrew verbs, and, and, and that nowadays, in 1980, the prophets didn't speak Hebrew, they spoke Spanish, and I decided to learn Spanish, and that's what brought me, Romero's martyrdom, for better or worse, brought me here, uh, and I came as a political scientist to study the crisis in Central America, went after the war ended, interacted with these people, and what I'm hearing from students who just came back, when I remember being that young, had the same effect on me, and so when I came, and then I had a different experience. In 1993, I went to do research on a reconciliation process, and I ended up in a human rights course at the Inter-American Institute for Human Rights, and it just so happened in 93 that the man who handed my certificate, you know, was Romero's, uh, the head of Romero's legal office. Uh, the man Romero said they're going to kill me for this speech and, and flee, Roberto Cuellar. And so there's a picture of in my office of a young me leaning up against the Romero um, award. So it was transformative for me. And when I came to the university after that experience, it's, we need a human rights program. And the joke from the president at the time was the University of Dayton's curriculum is a human rights program. That's what you do. So I just want to, I'll conclude with this, that... Um, December 6th, the first Romero recipient, Juan Ernesto Mendez from Argentina, who's world famous in, in, in human rights, will be back on campus for an event to commemorate the 20th anniversary. We'll be giving them the, Romero, the, the new Romero Award, the statue, that's wonderful. And in March of next year, we'll have the Romero um, Human Rights Award Ceremony and Symposium. So I involve you, invite you to get involved, but I, I'm just, gratified at experience I had in 1989 or 1993, you're all having now. Go to El Salvador and you come back energized to do social justice here. And so much of it is the living memory of uh, Monsignor Romero. Um, I would like to say something um, about the corruption in my home country, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua too. Um, I want to speak on behalf of them, not because we want to say that, I want to say that it's, we are saints, but at some point, we are victims, because we are the bridge of the El Car drugs from South America, from Colombia, so helicopters filled with drugs landing in El Salvador, in Honduras, and in Nicaragua and that drugs come here to the United States. And on the other hand, United States sent a lot of guns, AK-47, uh, I'm not 
very good in guns, but to those children, 13 year old, imagine one 13 year old with a gun. So what he could do, just kill, probably without not knowing what he's doing. So I just want to point it out, think about that. So that's what happened in all Central America, like the three countries of Central America that we're talking about. And um, thank you so much. And please, next time that you see a refugee or an immigrant, just give them a smile. Open your arm for them. Give them a hand, because you don't know why they come here. You just don't know. Thank you. Um, I think Romero, as a leader, the capacity and encouragement that Romero has is lacking in our leadership today. It's all about politics, whether it's in our church or whether it's in our government, who has money. And for some of us to take a stand, you know, you don't find too many people. So I just encourage you as young people, keep that in mind. Encourage leaders to take stance because that's what leaders need. Leaders need the will of the people to force them to take a stance that's what happened to Romero. The poor forced him. They came down from the hills and talked to him, said, Romero, you have to believe us. You have to stand with us. And we need to do that to our leaders and force them gently, force them to take courageous stance. Thank you. If you want to talk about El Salvador or ways to get there or what to study in Dr. Held's class, feel free to reach out. Um, and my last comment is just, uh, Oscar Romero, I have this book of like a lot of his homilies and things called The Violence of Love. And I think it's just a statement to let your love for others, for other humans, uh, be explosive, be, be so aggressive that it's violent, but it's filled with so much beauty and love. And that is all you can learn from Saint Oscar Romero. Yeah, I don't have too much more to add. Um, I definitely want to thank Dr. Hallett and this incredible panel of speakers here. I, sitting up here, I learned a lot as well. Um, I'd also like to thank the Human Rights Center um, for giving me this opportunity. And I would really encourage all of you, we have this incredible resource, the Human Rights Center. It's in the law school. I'm, I'm glad they moved it over there. It's less of a walk for me. But um, reach out. They do incredible things. There are ways to get involved, not only in the center, but also right here in Dayton. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, those of you who want to get a Q code for your path point, there are folks waiting by the doors um, to help you out with that. Thank you once more to our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you.